Anywho, uh, we are at the five after mark. So we are going to dive into this class. Uh, so I think a few people have been here before. Oop, look at that. Jock Stroud. Jock Stroud is in the house. Um, I think that's one of the interesting things with doing these classes. Is even though it's virtual, even though it's online, you do actually start to remember people. It's a very weird relationship thing we have in this modern world. It's like, it's like, oh, Jack Stroud, I know him. Jack Stroud, I don't know how the fuck you say his name, but anyways. Okay, the class, uh, the introduction that we do every single time. Uh, Silicon Dojo, an authorityless gatekeeperless free to the end user hands-on technology education that empowers you to do whatever the hell it is that you want to do. Basically, the idea with Silicon Dojo is what if technology that taught you skills was just as available as water? been thinking about this a lot lately kind of one of the things i think about i'm a buddhist like i'm actually a buddhist like my name is in a temple somewhere when i was a kid i had japanese ladies try to feed me these weird tofu things with peanut sauce on top they kept telling me it was a dessert anyways buddhist bad buddhist don't worry i'm not going to proselytize but one of the things i always think about like with education is kind of like uh back in the old days with buddhism like siddhartha under the bodhi tree with his students like think about that as an education system you have an instructor you have students you have tree to keep the sun off of you isn't that what education really is about and of course, we need some stuff in the modern world in order to actually teach what we're teaching. But what if we try to, instead of trying to make college education worth $200,000, what if we got back more to the idea of teacher, student, tree? And that's what I'm kind of trying to do here with Silicon Dojo. Uh, free to the end user is not actually free. Uh, uh, the fall, uh, life right now for me is still chaotic as hell. So I'm not pushing this a lot, but we do have a DonorBox account, DonorBox.org slash ETCG. If you want to throw a couple of dollars in because you find this to be valuable, uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, raise hands in Zoom. If you have a question, uh, go down to oh the reaction thing and raise your hand, whatever the hand raising thing is, um, and then I will be able uh, to answer your question. I do get some people that literally raise their hands, which is adorable. But does not work. Uh, let's see here. Copyright. Everything that I do, uh, almost everything that I do, is freely available for you. So if you go to GitHub, uh, there's everything there. You can download it. You can use it. You can create your own classes. You can sell your own classes based off of it. Uh, so that's all uh, there for you. Uh, Tippy tap or die. A lot of people think that uh, to become a technology professional, all they need to do is come to these classes, sit back, and learn. And that's not what it is to be a technology professional. What a real technology professional does is they bang their head against the wall a thousand times until the information gets into their head. Uh, we have projects every time we do these classes. There is at least three labs at the end of the class. Do those labs. Do the work. You will not be a technology professional unless you actually code and do stuff so that you understand when you forget to close single quotation marks or double quotation marks or whatever else uh, extra help w3schools.com is absolutely fabulous and again chat gpt is not actually intelligent but it is really good for helping you with coding problems uh, standardization uh, so we use vs code with the default settings basically this helps with troubleshooting so a lot of people ask can i use a different ide you can use whatever ide you want you can use notepad if you want if you want me to try to help you figure out where you forgot to put the double quotation marks, I will do my best. But if you're using Notepad, it's going to be a disaster. Um, let's see here. Uh, material, any additional material you need, uh, just so you know. Uh, Eli the Computer Guy. So if you go to Eli the Computer Guy channel, all these classes are actually recorded and they are uploaded. Uh, so far, we've been using Zoom to, to uh, record these videos. And so they're very bad, to be honest with you. Uh, but they are here. Uh, I am trying to use Wirecast now to actually be able to um, record the videos. So we'll see how that goes. I tried to use Wirecast last class. It did not go well. So maybe this class will go well. Who knows? I don't know. Uh, but anyways, classes are here if you miss them. And of course, GitHub is the big one. You go to GitHub Silicon Dojo Show Online Classes. All the material for the classes is here. Uh, so like today, Python, Bottle Framework. You can come here. Codes are here. Lab examples here. We have uh, 
the lab book and we have the workbook. I would highly recommend you download and print these. Um, so the workbook is basically um, uh, the PDF of all of the slides so you can write notes. Again, write notes. Everybody says, I don't need to write notes. You do. Anyways, uh, the notes are there. Um, and then uh, for the lab book, or the lab book is, uh, this is for the labs. So the three labs at the end, which is a little PDF. Um, anyways, there's a PDF here, I swear. It exists. I would recommend that you download it. Uh, trolls, just so you know, um, we haven't had a big problem with trolls. Uh, we did have trolls in the past uh, for one of the classes. Just so you know, uh, chat is on. Chat is on currently. Here's how I deal with here's how I deal with chat and trolls. If trolls pop in the chat, I turn off chat for everybody, and you're done for a while. That's just the easiest way to go about it. Uh, and you should all be muted. I just realized. Ha ha. You are not fully muted before, so now you all are fully muted. So again, if you want to say something, raise a hand in Zoom, and you can ask a question. There you go, and I'll allow you to unmute yourself. Uh, so, I think that's it. I think that's it. So let us get into Bottle. I love Bottle so much. Uh, like one of the big problems that I have uh, being a technology instructor is that whenever you're going to be building anything in technology or supporting anything in technology, everything is built on top of each other, right? So, uh, so like when you're trying to learn TCP IP, it's like, well, you got the Ethernet standard and you've got TCP IP addressing and you've got DNS and you've got ICMP and IGMP and you've got this thing called a protocol suite. And on top of that, you've got network cards. And on top of that, you've got an operating system. And then for the operating system, communicate with the network card. Then you have uh, device drivers. Uh, so one of the big problems with new people is when I try to teach them technology. <laughs> uh, it's kind of hard because you got to like throw people into the middle of this mess and just tell them yes it's it's gonna be confusing it's gonna be a pain in the ass at some point it'll start to to make sense to you um and so that's one of the issues uh, so we start talking about python right one of the amazing things about python is python can do damn near anything with the right framework right so python is the programming language frameworks are basically Oh, all these additional packages of functions and libraries and all that kind of stuff that allow you to do certain things, uh, build web applications, um, build all kinds of different stuff, right? Build a de desktop application. So it's something called Tkinter that allows you to create graphical desktop applications. Uh, computer vision, there's an open CV, a framework, that type of thing. Well, one of the problems that we get into is with building web apps. Is if you look at a lot of the frameworks out there, uh, they're really cool. Uh, but also, um, pretty complicated at the exact same time. Uh, so like Django, if you want to build web apps with Django, Django is an awesome framework. But oh my god, <laughs> there's so many credit. <laughs> right, there's something called an or ORM. There's an ORM if you want to deal with a database, you've got to deal with the ORM. Uh, it's a MVC, is it an MVC or is it an MVT or does that even make any sense? That's an argument. Anyways, right, there's all this stuff. You try to learn Django, it's all this stuff. A lot of the, the frameworks, they do a lot of amazing things. Incredibly powerful, much better than Bottle, better than Bottle. But my God, they're a pain in the ass. <laughs> like, how do you teach people, right? So anyways, uh, the thing that I like about the Bottle framework is that it is dirt simple. There is no ORM, um, object relationship management when you're dealing with databases. There is no ORM. MVC, who the hell cares? Like all this stuff, it doesn't matter. What do you have when you have uh, when you're dealing with bottle? Is uh, a script, like any of these scripts up here. But basically, this is the most simple script, where you write your script. At the end of it is a run function. Uh, you literally, uh, you literally just run this script. So you don't have to call out. You don't have to call out from a from a command line. Uh, you know, command or whatever from somewhere else. You literally just write the script, you run the script, and if you do that, then you have a web app. And so, 
why this is very useful is if you're trying to create uh, basic dashboards. So we talk about this with a single pane of glass uh, in the IT world, where what a single pane of glass is, is if I'm like the IT director, I can walk in, I can look at a big screen, and on the screen, I have all my metrics, right? It's incredibly good for doing single panes of uh, glass, as I say. Um, it's good for building IoT things, it's good for building dashboards, it's good for building uh, small REST APIs, that type of thing. And it's very good for creating uh, troubleshooting uh, tools. Uh, so basically you can just have this on your computer, you can run it. Once you run it, you have this nice little uh, web graphical interface, and then you can you know, do whatever it is that you need to do in your particular environment. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so what is Bottle? So Bottle is a web app on what's called a micro framework. And what we mean by micro framework is it's small. It's not like Django. It doesn't have everything in the world, right? It's just, it is what it is. It does not include a database. It does not include SQLite. You can connect to SQLite, but it doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, have SQLite um, from the get-go. It doesn't have a lot of all that kind of stuff. Uh, in order to install it, uh, very simple, as we've done with other modules, Python 3, space hyphen M, pip, install, bottle, and that's it. That's all you have to do to install it. Uh, they have their document thing here. Open. And you go, uh, just to look at the documentation, you can click on this, uh, bottlepy.org, docs, dev, and you can go through here, and basically it'll give you almost all the instructions you need uh, for whatever it is that you're going to be trying to build. Again, the big thing, like with bottle, it's like with any product, in the technology world is just keep in mind what you're building. You're not building the next Instagram with it. You're not building the next Facebook with it. You're building the dashboard. You're building a small, like a REST API thing. As long as you keep that in mind, you should be fine. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the basic architecture, uh, when we're taking a look at Bob. Uh, so that's going to be one of the things when we start dealing with these, uh, these web app frameworks. There's a lot of stuff involved. So normally, if you've done web development in the past, um, you know, you have Apache 2 or you have Nginx. Uh, basically, you have um, some kind of uh, scripting language, PHP, Ruby on Rails, something like that. Uh, basically, you have files and folders and a directory structure and that's pretty simple. Now, the big thing to understand is when you start dealing with Python uh, web app frameworks is just the, the mentality behind these web app frameworks is different. It's not necessarily uh, more complicated. It's just a different way of doing it that, frankly, is more secure in many ways, right? So, uh, so if you have, let's say this is, is, you have your web app here. And basically, uh, from the get-go, right now, we're just dealing with bottle. So what are the different components when we're talking about this particular uh, web app, right? So we're going to have Python. Right? So Python is our main programming language, and this is what's going to do all of like the back-end intelligence, right? Do you need to uh, communicate with a SQL database? That will be done in Python. Do you need to connect with a REST API? that will be done in Python. If you get a value in and then you need to do an if else statement based off of the value, that is going to be dealt with in Python, right? So all of the intelligence, anything you think about like intelligent, if else conditionals, reaching out, whatever else, that is going to be dealt with with a Python uh, language. Uh, bottle itself, right? Bottle, all Bottle does is basically it presents the results from Python um, onto uh, the web page, or basically it does some kind of a web action. It redirects to a different web page. It prints everything up on the screen, that type of thing. Basically what Bottle is going to be doing is Bottle is going to be sending information to Python and receiving information back from Python in order to give you that web app uh, that you're going to be uh, looking at. Uh, also within this, though, is you're going to be dealing with an issue of static files. So this is an interesting thing when you start building these kind of modern web apps, is that security is a big deal. You may not have heard that before, but security is a big deal. And so anyways, back in the old day, when you had an Apache web server, right, the Apache web server uh, had your index files and all your other files. And then under that, it also had your image files and it had your style, your CSS files. And basically, all of those files were in a directory structure that you could take a look at. 
Basically, you could normally do something like FTP. You could simply put FTP into your browser, put in CNN.com or whatever website you're going to, and you would actually see this beautiful little file structure here. And you could actually open and take a look at the different files uh, without actually going through the web browser. You could open it up with VS Code or whatever else uh, to look for things like vulnerabilities. So again, one of the big things to be thinking about uh, in the security world is something called operational security, right? There's physical security. Uh, Physical security is uh, uh, permissions and passwords and encryption and that type of thing. Uh, operational security is basically keeping people from understanding what the hell it is that you're doing, right? Uh, was it security through um, uh, security through people not knowing that there's a problem there? But anyways, right? So anyways, one of the issues with Apache or Nginx and the old ways of doing web app development is people could see all of your files, all of your folders, all of your scripts, and try to figure out where there's a little vulnerability to try to attack. So anyway, so what, uh, what these new web app uh, platforms do, uh, frameworks do, is basically they have a static file folder. Um, and with this, Basically, you only get those static files when the web app requests it, right? So uh, if a bottle needs, a, needs to deliver a CSS file, right, your cascading style sheet file, basically it will request that file from the static folder. That file will be included with what goes uh, out to the user. Uh, and basically, the static uh, folder is, is secure. You can't simply just scan through it like you used to before. If you want to add images, any of that type of thing, that will be in this static uh, folder uh, so that it's accessible uh, by the web app. One of the things to be thinking about, though, with this static folder, again, from a security standpoint, is that generally, the static folder should actually be somewhere else. Right. So again, one of the things to be thinking about is the architecture systems. Again, architecture, right? Anyways, uh, one of the things to be thinking about is having different servers or systems to do specific things, right? The more every piece of functionality that your server has is also a vulnerability. Again, so if you have an FTP server, the fact that people can upload files to that FTP server is both a good thing because you need the utility, but it's also a bad thing because somebody can upload files to that FTP server. Now, if you can email to a server, there's vulnerabilities there. Everything has a vulnerability. And so that's one of the problems with the old servers. Basically, you have everything on that one box. If somebody can compromise your FTP server, they might be able to get into your web server. If somebody's able to compromise your SQL server, they might be able to get into the rest of your server, whole nine yards. And so one of the things to think about is that every service is on a different server, right? So a bottle is on this server, a SQL is on this server, files, so basically your static files are in this server, and something else is on this different server. Even if somebody's able to compromise something in one of these servers, they can't compromise everything. So anyway, so one of the things to be thinking about with uh, the static files, static folders, when you're creating a web app, is many times the idea is that these are actually going to be somewhere else. Again, we talk about service-oriented architecture. So instead of having static files, and folders sitting on the same server as your bottle app, they may all be off an AWS, right? You get a storage bucket on AWS. All it does is contain files and folders. And then basically, uh, when bottle makes the request, it makes the request to AWS instead of making a request to your local computer. Um, anyways, it gives you a bit more security. Uh, depending on what you're doing, may or may not matter, right? If you if you are going to be building, you're going to be using Bottle, and you're actually going to deploy it up to DigitalOcean, right? You're creating some kind of REST API, uh, then, then worrying about where your static files are, uh, that might really matter to you. Uh, on the other hand, if you're just building some kind of little uh, diagnostic system as a system administrator, so you can ping things or whatever else, you may not care where the static files are, and so you may just put those directly onto your computer. So anyways, that's the idea with static files. Uh, and then you have templates. So templates are interesting. Again, a lot of people ask, Eli, how many languages do I need to know to become a technology professional? Lots, lots. Again, that idea. Which language do I need to learn? Uh, so you have these things called templates. Uh, and with the templates, you have a template language. Um, and if we take a look at a template language, um, now where's my TPL? 
Uh, this is kind of sort of what a template language looks like. And so basically the idea with templates, with bottle, right? Python figures out all this information, it sends it to bottle, and then one of the things that that bottle can do is instead of creating uh, the entire web page on the fly, it can access a template, it can send variable values to the template, and then the template can automatically format itself uh, based off of those variable values that's been given. And so that's where like with this template, so it says hello and the name uh, that was presented to it, so uh, squiggly squiggly space name close squiggly squiggly because that's how they do it in this template language if you do use django their template language is slightly different uh, then here they do um, percentage if so if name equals bob name is awesome bob is awesome else name is not as cool as bob because everybody knows bob is the coolest and then you end and so anyways, with this, uh, there's a lot of different things you can do with these template languages. Uh, we're not going to do a lot of that today. That just gets long and tedious and horrible. It's a great thing to use ChatGPT for. But this is one of the ways that when you're presenting information to the uh, end user, and instead of being a, instead of simply dynamically sending the HTML, you can send values to a template file, and then that template file will print everything out for you. All right. So anyway, so that's basically a kind of an idea of the basic architecture of what one of these bottle apps would look like. Uh, you have bottle, which is basically right the web app uh, you have python which is basically the intelligence you have static files uh, which is basically all the static files again things like we talk about static files like css is a static file images are a static file videos are a static file that type of thing uh, then we have the templates and then finally if you are using databases uh, so again a relational pro database mysql mariadb a sql like we're going to have a class on that in a couple of weeks uh, you would also then have a database to connect for that kind of uh, functionality so this is the basic architecture, and hopefully this will make more sense as we go through the class. Then the next thing to ask is, uh, how do you put this thing into production? So, uh, so all you need to run Bottle is click the Go button, or Python 3, and, and access it, and it'll start running. But is that how you would put it into production? Uh, no. No, that's not what you would do to throw it up on the digital ocean. There's a lot of documentation out there. It's a bit of a pain in the ass. Uh, anyways, uh, one of the things that I would say, I did not put here, I should put here, is make sure you use a virtual environment. We haven't had a class on virtual environments yet. Anyways, we'll have that class. Create a virtual environment if you're going to put this into production. Uh, you do get an option of the Python web servers. Uh, so again, things that you don't really realize when you're dealing with Python is there are a lot of different Python web servers out there. Uh, again, Django uh, has a built-in web server that you're not supposed to use. There's a web server called Gunicorn, which is a Python web server. And basically what the Python web server is, is a, is a program that's, that's specifically used uh, to be optimized in order to, to allow Python scripts to be used in web apps, right? Anyways, that's very good. The issue, though, is, is if you just have the Python web server on its own, you can run into some bottleneck issues with, uh, with users actually trying to access your app. Now, again, it doesn't matter. It does depend on the load of your app. So if you're used to getting one person every 10 minutes, who the hell cares? But if you actually, again, you're going to be creating something like a REST app, it might really matter. And so that's why you use Nginx uh, in front of it. Something called a reverse proxy server. See how, see how this crap gets really complicated really fast? It's like, hey, yeah, bottle is so simple. Let me just take the next half an hour to explain all this stuff before we get to the simple stuff. Anyway, so basically, uh, when you look at it, uh, you would have bottle, right? So you have your bottle, you know, you have your, your little, little at your, your script that you created here, and that's going to be your web app. Right, that is going to have to go through the Python web server. Again, probably something like Gunicorn. Uh, so Bottle can use a number of different types of web server. Again, depending on your particular environment and what you're using, you can go in there and modify it. We're not dealing with that crap today, but you can. Uh, then past that, you need to use something most likely called NGINX. NGINX. So what the cool kids use nowadays, instead of Apache, apparently Apache is for the old people, Nginx is what the new kids use. Uh, and basically what Nginx is used for is something called, again, it's called a reverse, reverse proxy server. So what a proxy server is, 
anyways, what proxy server is, is if you have a network where multiple people need to be able to go out and access a resource on the internet, a proxy server allows all of your users to go through this one server to then go out to the internet and get an access to something. Nowadays, web proxies, if you go back 20 years, and, and literally back in 2000 was the last time I dealt with a web proxy uh, in this way. But anyways, that, that's the idea. Right before NAT, again, there's something called network address translation. NAT, that's built into every router nowadays. Anyways, before that, we have these things called web proxy servers. And so multiple users can basically access some resource going through that one server. Basically, what a reverse proxy server is, is so when people are coming in from the outside world, the reverse proxy server is able to send to theoretically to things like multiple servers. So let's say you had your web app running on a cluster of servers instead of a single server. As users come in, the reverse proxy server will then route to the different servers as need be. The important thing here is basically with engine, within, in, within, within, Engine X is there is a lot of functionality for basically being able to route traffic, make th make sure sessions are available and that type of thing. And so basically that's why you generally you would put Engine X in front of your bottle app. And that's kind of sort of why. Again, we are not going to deal with that today because we're not going to be deploying crap to the internet. And that is its own barrel of stupidity that I don't have the brain power for right now. But I just want you to know it exists. If you're like, wow, this is easy. Great, go learn that stuff. Uh, let's see here, the bottle basics. Uh, so basically uh, when we do this, uh, again, we're going to be uh, uh, installing the module uh, bottle uh, using pip. Uh, and then from there, uh, we are then going to pull, we're going to import different functions into our script to allow us to do whatever it is that we want to do. At the end of the script, you're always going to do run. So it's a run function. You're going to say host equals. And so generally, when you do host equals, you're either going to put in local host or 127.0.0.1. That is what is called the loopback address for your computer. So basically, when you're on the web browser, instead of going out to the internet, it's just going to go to its own internal IP address so that it's able to, to see whatever it's going to see. So it's going to be local host. You then have the port. So the port is something called a TCP port, Transmission Control Protocol port. Uh, normally you don't see it, right? So if you go to um, CNN.com, let's say, uh, you're actually going to CNN.com uh, port 80. Uh, so basically uh, when you're dealing with TCP IP, you have something called IP addresses. Uh, so, oh, I don't know, 26.55. Uh, 24.1, right? So this is the IP address. The IP address on its own doesn't actually matter for much. Then there's something called a subnet mask. Let's say 255.0.0.0. What the subnet mask does is it tells you what part of the IP address is the network address and what part of the IP address is the computer address. So if you see 255 like this, basically it means this is the network address. Everything here is the uh, is the computer address so it knows basically where to route it uh, and then you have tcp ports and so what the tcp ports are is this is for specific services uh, so smtp simple mail transfer protocol oh lordy so port 25 i think it's port 25 ssh is port 22 um ssl is that 443 uh, http for web traffic is the by default port 80. And so since it's by uh, default by port 80, you don't have to put in cnn.com colon 80 because it always defaults to port 80. So you simply put in cnn.com to go to whatever web page or whatever you want. Well, the thing is, um, with most of these computers, again, having port 80 open, getting traffic directed to it is probably a no-no as far as security is concerned. And so what they default to is generally uh, port 8080. 
So again, whether you're using Bottle or Django or whatever else, and you set up a web server, if it doesn't default to port 80, it'll default to port 8080. Port 8080 is a no TCP port for presenting uh, web pages, web apps, that type of thing. It is just simply not the default. Um, and so when you do this, so you go uh, host equals localhost or 8080, what that means is when you go to your computer, and you tippy tap type in the address, you will type in 127.0.0.1. So this is the loopback address. This is the IP address for your computer. And then you will do colon 8080. And that will be the full address to get to your web app basically as long as it's running. Um, let's see here. Uh, one of the big things uh, is when you're doing this is do make sure your script is running. Again, I know nobody is as stupid as me, but I can say as a stupid tech professional, it's amazing how, how many times I forget to run my script. So if your script is not running, nothing will show up when you go here. So do make sure your script is running. Also do make sure uh, if you make any uh, modifications to your script, right? One of the problems you can have when you're using VS Code, it's not really a problem, but like right now, right? This, I have a script running. I don't have some script running. Here's the thing. If I realize, oh, there's a problem with this script. And then I go in and I start modifying the script. And then I go back to the web page uh, to take a look at what it looks like, wherever the hell it is, uh, and nothing changes, right? It's like, wait a minute, I thought I changed things. Well, if you don't, if you don't stop your script and then restart your script, um, basically it will not work, right? So you have to stop and then restart. Again, when in doubt, reboot or whatever the equivalent is. Uh, let's see here. Uh, so, okay, let's go and we take a look at this. So this is our first teeny tiny little hello world script. Uh, so as, again, Python, this is how Python is. You gotta import everything. You don't import it, it don't exist. From bottle import run, so the run function is what's allow us going to actually run this script, and route. So route is the function that basically gives you the route, gives you those little pages to go to. Um, what you're going to do here is you're going to notice it says at route. And so it's at route forward slash. So basically this just means the root. So at route root. Now, whenever you see an at, this is something called a decorator. So this is the function, right? Define index, blah, blah, crappy function, whatever. What decorators are is they're functions that essentially you can layer on to the function that, that you're about to call. So basically what I'm gonna say here is I want all of the, fun the functionality of the route function added to this particular function and then that gets me something, right? So the route function, whatever the hell is in there, that's basically, again, the route, how traffic gets routed, how the page is presented, all of that kind of stuff, right? So uh, anytime you're gonna have a page, you're gonna need an app route, right? So if I wanna do like about, I would do slash about, and there will be a route about would get you to this, whatever. Uh, then under that, you actually need to, you need to have a function for what you want to have happen. So define function name as you would before. Uh, we're not, we're not sending any variable values into this. We do colon message equals h1 hello world slash h1. And then we're going to return message. So with this function, when we return, it is going to get returned to the web browser, not to, you know, the, the command line or whatever. Uh, so basically, if I hit run now, so as long as it's working, as long as it's working, you should see something like this, listening on HTTP, localhost, colon, 8080. Uh, you can actually go here, and you should be able to hit command, and this, and so now we can see. So this is my web browser, right? This is my normal Safari, right? So there's YouTube, there's GitHub, whatever else. Uh, so I don't know if you can see it from here, but localhost colon 8080, nothing else because this is the root directory, and we have hello world. Yay, you just made a web app. 
Um, again, how this routing works is I can do this. So if I want to, control C, let me shut this down for a second. Um, I can do control V and then I can say about. So if I want to create an about page, I can say about and I can say in the about page, I can say I am so cool. Because, I mean, that's obvious, right? Why do you want to learn from Eli the computer guy? Man, because he's cool. Anyways, uh, so make, make sure to save, Can command S, so I save. So we run this, we go to 8080. Okay, so we have hello world. So this is going to my root, right? And that gets me my hello world. Now, all I do is I do the forward slash about. And so you notice there's no about.htm. There's no about.php. It's just about. And it says, I am so cool. And so basically, if you're just going to simply be creating a web page with this system, you know, it's this, but more complicated. <laughs> add a lot more CSS, add a lot more information, and you can create your index and your about and your contact us and all of that kind of thing. And that is through, again, this very simple, uh, basically using the route. So at route, this is a decorator, this is root, and so root will give us hello world. At route, uh, at about, um, at route slash about, we create a function for about, and it says, I am so cool, and it returns that. You can then just multiply this out to however many pages you want in your uh, your web uh, your website or whatever else for that, that basic functionality. Is everybody following along at this point? Hands if anybody's lost. Uh, got a thumb up, or, yep, yeah, okay. So thumb up, we'll keep going. Okay, so the next thing is, I do need to get better when <laughs> I keep getting lost. Uh, so that's the bottle basics. Uh, then we get to dynamic routes, right? So that's called a static route in the bottle world. Now we get to dynamic routes. The cool thing is with dynamic routes is you can actually give your bottle web application information directly through the URL. It's kind of like a Git, but not really, uh, basically. Uh, you can do slash uh, and then value and whatever the value is, right? So string, so name, whatever else. Uh, there are filters that you can put in there. So by default, the value that you're going to put in is going to be a string. So again, we talk about data types. Data types are strings, ints, floats, bools, blobs, lots of different stuff. Anyways, basically by default, the data type is going to be string. You can put in for int, you can put in for float, you can put something in for path or filter. Um, you know, it's a guide, it's, it's a guide. <laughs> it's a guide. It's kind of like tells bottle what it's supposed to be. And then bottle just does what it's got to do. Cause that's the thing, like when you're dealing with data types, data types are important, especially with databases, making sure again, garbage in, garbage out. If you ask for somebody's age and they give you Bob, that's going to cause you problems. And the issue with some of these things is they'll ask for that kind of thing. And how, st how strict the language is for data types is, you know, it can be a bit wonky and that's how bottle is. Uh, anyways, let's go to bottle values. Uh, and we have this script. Uh, so this is pretty simple, right? So from bottle import run for us to be able to run and a route so that we have a route. That's all we need to do here. Uh, then it created two functions or basically two routes just to kind of show you how this works. So at route forward slash name. So we have to go to route slash name and then slash and I can put in a name, Tim or Bob or Suzanne. We're going to define a function, so define the index function. Now, this is an important thing, right? We're bringing in a variable value from that URL. And so in order for our function to be able to use it, we actually have to input into the function. So basically, name here is name here. So we're going to bring in name, and we put it here. Uh, so message equals f string h1 hello, the value for name, and then we return it. Right, so if we go to slash name, slash name, slash Tim, it'll say, hello, Tim, and that'll simply get returned. 
And then to show you how multiple values can be sent is at route name slash, again, you have these little arrow things. So these arrow things are important. So this is what says that this is a value that is going, right? So arrow thing name slash, and then we do uh, forward slash here, we do arrow, then age. So the name of the value is going to be age, and we're going to do a filter called for int. So supposedly it's going to be an int. Who knows what you're actually going to get. Anyways, uh, then we're going to do name underscore age function. Name is going to be a value that comes in. Age is going to be a value that comes in. So we're going to say, hello, Tim, you are 18 years old, and that is going to get returned to us. So if we go here, and I run this thing, uh, I go to command, and um, I bring this up. Now notice, I bring this script up. So every script is different. So I'm only running this particular script now. And in this particular script, I didn't put anything in for the root. So when it goes to root, it's going to give me a not found, because it's not found, because I don't have a path, right? Or I don't have a route, I suppose. So I can go up here. I can do slash, I can do name, I can do slash, let's say Bobby, and then I hit enter, and so it says, hello, Bobby, right? If we go and take a look at this, so we have name, so slash name, and the actual name, we send that name to this function, we print that name out there, and that is where we get hello, Bobby, right? If we go here, and again, we wanna do more, let's say Timmy, and we want Timmy to be 18. So I know you probably can't see it, but follow me here. So it's localhost colon 8080 slash name slash Timmy slash 18. And then it's going to say, hello, Timmy, you are 18 years old. Um, I do believe if I make this a float. Oh, no, it failed. Okay, it did cause an error. So if you put in 18.9, it causes an error. So anyways, but anyways, that's uh, what you can do. And basically with this, again, so you can send name, name, and then age, we're gonna have it be an int. So anyways, uh, Jock Stroud, what's up? So, me and this is a lot of information today. So, um, I might have missed it when you explained it, but you don't have to put the name or the age in the actual code for it to come up as it in the in the web browser. I'm I'm and because you're making it dynamic. We're making it dynamic. Like, yeah. So, but you still have to put it in the URL in a sense to get it to function that way, and that's because of the route in a sense. I don't know if I'm asking the question right. Like, how is it becoming dynamic? I suppose that you don't have to put it in the script. So this is a dynamic route because you're putting in information that is going to be sent to the function for the function to do something with. So, so slash name, so slash name is just whatever slash. And then this is saying, I want a variable, uh, variable name called name. And so there's going to be a value here. And then I want a variable name called age, and that value is going to be here. So I do name Tim 19. Tim is going to come here. 19 is going to come here. And then that, now we have name that's going to be able to be, it be able to be used in the function, and age is going to be able to be used in the function. Oops. Don't mute yourself. <laughs> While we're asking questions, make sure to Keep yourself unmuted because I have to unmute you every time. Anyways, does that make sense? Sort of. It's, it's, if we go over another example, I think I'll get it. It's just like you're just making, so when you put it in and they put it, is there something you're putting in or you like your host is putting in? Like when you say name, age, int? Well, no, so here, let me show you. So I can do like this. So route, all I'm going to do here is let's say message. And then message, and um, then we're just going to return uh, message equals message. That's messy. Anyways, that should work though. Okay, so let me make sure this works. Uh, ba -ba -ba. This might not work. Oops.
Hello. No, so Prince, thank God. Okay, so basically what we're doing here, right? So this is the simplest. This is actually, I don't even need that really. This is the simplest. So at route, so we, right, we have the root. Then I'm gonna create a variable name for this, this dynamic route called message. So basically slash and then whatever I put in here, that is gonna get passed to this function as a variable name message. Once it's in this function, I can do whatever, with it, whatever I want with it. I can put it into a database, I can do a REST API call, whatever. That is now a, a Python variable value. Um, all I'm doing here is I'm just simply returning it. And so basically this, this is how you can pass values with bottle through the URL, basically to the underlying uh, Python functions so that you can do something with it. So you use the URL as like as a is making the URL like a I guess a tunnel or a tube where that you can pass information through. So you, like you said, you can go to a database, you can go to a website, you can go to an API. Yeah. Through the URL in a sense. Yeah, so like where you'll see this a lot is something called content management systems. Uh, so if you go to New York Times or whatever, you'll see like slash and then maybe like a uh, Oh, like a post ID or something like that. And so what's happening is that post ID is being sent to the back end uh, programming language. That back end language is then going to the database saying, give me all the information for this post ID, bringing that back, right dynamically writing the HTML document for you and then sending it to you. Slowly in it, slowly in it, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's all. Yeah, again, I think that's the whole thing with technology. Again, that's one of the things with Silicon Dojo. Like one of the most important things with this whole concept is that we're going to be doing a lot of classes. Again, my life has just been chaotic for the past month. Uh, but part of it is just the idea is that you keep coming and then you slowly grasp the concept of what's going on. Again, it's a... Uh, Again, uh, I did martial arts for years and years and years and years. Um, and it's the idea of every, every day you come into class and the instructor, you're like, you go, you go to hit something and the instructor's like, no, this. And then you go, okay. And then like the next week, he's like, no, no, this. And then like, they keep doing it for like a fucking year. And you're like, ah. And then like one day you just like hit the bat and it's just, and you're like, oh. That's how I hit something, right? Anyways, so that's basically the idea with this is that, uh, you guys will slowly, slowly, slowly build up the information for hopefully all this makes sense. Any more questions? No. Nope. Um, okay. Um, so that is what it's called dynamic routes. And where the hell is my... Uh... There we go. Uh, those are dynamic routes. Um, then we can do redirects. Um, so redirects are just, I don't know, they're just redirects. Basically, uh, somebody comes to your web page, and then you can redirect them somewhere else. Uh, so I'd say this is great for security. Uh, so we talked about this, but so uh, we did the class on REST APIs before, where I can take your IP address, uh, and then based off of your IP address, I can see where you're from, what country you're from, what state you're from, what city you're from. And so one of the things you can do if you want to protect your website from those darn, you know, Zimbabwean hackers. Um, I always say Zimbabwean, because if you say Chinese, they get all mad. The Zimbabweans are like, thank you, somebody noticed us. <laughs> Anyways, the Zimbabwean hackers are trying to get at your site. One of the things you could do is you could detect, obviously you can grab their IP address. You can see that they're coming from Zimbabwe and then you could simply redirect them to CNN.com. <laughs> You're like, oh, don't hack my site. Go hack CNN.com. Anyways, uh, basically just redirects you uh, to another web page. Uh, bottle redirect. Um, and this is all it is, right? Uh, so again, every single function you're gonna have to import. So if you're doing something and it doesn't work, most likely you forgot to import the function. From bottle, import run, import route, import redirect, right? Route is just the forward slash, so root, define index, site equals, HTTP, CNN.com, and redirect to the site. So basically all that's gonna happen is when you come here, it is going to redirect you directly to CNN.com. And again, this could be much more complicated. You gotta have a lot of Python programming in here. Uh, so if I run this and then, I do not know why I have this terminal open. 
Okay, so um, so I run this. I go to localhost colon eighty eighty root, and that will then take me to CNN.com. It's one of the functionalities. It exists. Uh, again, there is not much to this, and uh, uh, you could use this, you know, if you if you have a database of different sites. So again, imagine for your company, you want to create a database um, that contains important information. Again, um, uh, Stack Overflow. Let's say Stack Overflow has different things that might be relevant to your particular users. You could simply come up with a whole list of the different URLs there, and then you could have those within your own, your own database. Somebody could do a search. When they click on something, they could then just be auto uh, redirected to Stack Overflow, that type of deal. Anyways, it's a redirect, not much to say. Uh, Jock, yep. You go to the website, this doesn't happen to me, and someone hacks your site, they just put this little piece of code in, direct into their website. Say, for instance, you put a, like a really standard HTML website, and you, yep. you can hack your, they didn't necessarily can hack your server, but just put this little piece of code in to wherever, and so it directs, whoever goes to your URL, it directs it to their site without changing your URL, really. Can you see the question? Same saying, oh, not really. Yeah, I, I get it. That's that's kind of let's do that as an after class. Okay. Uh, so yeah, yeah, hackers can get in, and again, they can redirect. That's why security security matters on your servers. Um, but that's that's a whole different headers and all that kind of stuff. Uh, let's see here. Um, okay, so that's basically all there is to redirect. Uh, then post. Uh, post is going to be one of the most uh, valuable things for you. Again, when you look at most web apps that are valuable, one of the things that you're going to find to be kind of humorous is that they're dirt simple, right? Uh, when people look at programming, right, they look at like the metaverse crap. They look at what Apple is doing with spatial operating systems or whatever. They're like, wow, that's where the real money in technology is. Uh, let me tell you, the real money in technology is just crappy database applications. Put in data, pull out data, yay, right? Something that's customized uh, to the users. Uh, so anyways, that's where post is valuable. Uh, basically, it's function, or it's a utility tool, whatever, uh, for HTML. So basically with an HTML form, uh, you can use something called a method called post. And basically people can plug information into a form. They hit the submit button. And then all of that information is then sent to a script somewhere and the values are pulled out and then you're able to do what you want with it, right? So if you're dealing with a CRM solution, a customer relationship management solution, basically somebody, uh, you, you put in all the information that then gets dumped into a database and then maybe Maybe the sales agents get access to that information and then they can make um, have conversations with people later, right? If you want to do a note taking app, so one of the labs that we're going to be doing today is a note taking app. Uh, basically, all that is is an HTML form. You plug some information into the HTML form, you hit submit, that will then be written directly to a text file. That's the data store that we're using today uh, so that you can access it later, right? So basically, when we're talking about post, this is simply just going to be an HTML form. Right, uh, processes HTML uh, from bottle import post. So you're always going to need to do post. Uh, there is a decorator for post. And then when we want the value, and I'll show you this in the function itself, is you're going to do request.forms.get. So there's something called get. So when you're sending information over web pages, there's a post and a get. Post kind of does it invisibly. Get does it within the URL itself. Request.forms.get gets the value from a post request. Uh, for a request.query.get, that is for a get request. I'll show you that stuff in a second. Anyway, so let's go to the bottle post. Uh, ba -ba -ba, bottle post. Oh, so this is a little bit longer, but not really that big a deal, right? So. Okay, so uh, from bottle, import run, run, post, and request. So we're going to have our normal route. So our normal route, that basically what we're going to do is we are simply going to create an HTML form. So we had an HTML class before. HTML is, is dirt simple. Don't worry. 
Uh, so at route, basically the index, define index function, the form. So we're going to create this form. So it's just an HTML form. Form action equals slash process. So we're going to be sending this to, a, to process, right? So that, that has to correspond somewhere in this mess. Um, so we're going to send the action to process method equals post. So you'll notice I open this with triple single quotation marks and close with triple single quotation marks. It allows me to do this on multiple lines. I use single quotation marks here because inside I'm dealing with HTML and I have to use double, uh, double quotation marks in here for these different values. So again, you can do double quotation marks on the outside, and single quotation marks on the inside, or single quotation marks on the outside and double quotation marks on the inside, one or the other. Can't use both at the same time. Anyway, so form actions uh, process method equals post. We're going to have name, input type equals text. So this is just simply the, the, the type of information that's coming in. Um, and name equals name. So this is going to be the, the basically the identifier for how we get the information in the, the process script. We're going to break. This breaks to a new line in HTML. And then we're going to have input type equals submit. So we're going to have name and a text box. And then we're going to have a submit button, and then we're going to close the form. Then we're going to have page. So page equals, we use f string, and so we do h1 web app. So this could be like the header, and then we put in form. So form is here, and then we're going to return the entire page. Then we simply come down here to process. So whatever you put into that form, it's going to get sent to process. So here we're going to use post. So this is a decorator, so the at post decorator. Uh, we're going to do slash process, define index process for the function, name equals request dot forms, since this is post, dot get, and this is simply the identifier. So we called it name here. Because we called it name here, in order to get the access to it, we have to call the name down here. We could name this whatever we want. This is how we identify it. And then we're simply going to print out the, the message is then going to be message equals f string hello whatever the name is that came in, and then we're going to return message. Yay, we're gonna run localhost at port 80. So if we run this, I do command. So we have web app, name, text box, submit. I plug in Bob, I hit submit. Hello, Bob. And so again, it could be much more complicated. Again, you could take that information, send it off to a database, do whatever the hell it is that you want to do. But this just shows you all you have to do in order to use a post is basically you create the, uh, the, the HTML form. You send the action, has to be to whatever name you call it. We then use the at post decorator for that name. And then in order to get access to those values coming in, it's request.forms.getName. And you'll notice here, right, when we sent values using dynamic, um, oh, how do I call them, dynamic filters, dynamic, dynamic routes, there we go. When we, we used dynamic routes in order to send values, we had to put the variable names in here so that the function could access it. When we're sending post, we don't have to do that. We're simply getting it from this the request.forms.get, and then we pull the name value. Does that make sense? Everybody on board? Cool. Um, let's see here. Uh, then we have get, right? So get, uh, basically what this does is you process information through the URL. Right. So if you go to the if you're looking in your web browser and you're doing things on different kind of web applications, websites, especially like uh, oh, Amazon, that type of thing, what you'll notice is up in the URL, it'll start to add information to that URL. And that's how it's actually sending values to the underlying web app is through Git. Um, it's a very simple way of being able to send information. It's also a very insecure way of doing it. So whether or not you want to do it. Uh, from bottle, import git. So we did imported post before. So for this, we have to import git. Basically, uh, when you do git, so it's a href, right? So if you have a hyperlink, a href, and then at the end, at the end of the page, 
that, that you're sending the information to, you do question mark. That basically says you're going to start sending uh, values. Uh, then you say what the variable name is. So here we're going to say color equals red. So basically what we're going to say, what we're doing here is to the web app, we're sending the variable name of color and the value of red to it. And then we're going to pull that information. Uh, so we use the at get decorator. And then for this, so color is going to equal request.query. So before it was form, it's query.get, and then the color value coming in. If we do bottle get, this is what we have. Uh, so here uh, I'm showing you, you can actually use uh, multiple decorators uh, for the exact same function. So we have the route decorator and we have the get decorator. So we're going to send a get value here. So anyways, uh, from bottle import run, route, get, and request. Now route, so the route for the root is going to be this. Basically, it's going to print this stuff out on the screen. Uh, we're also going to use the get decorator for the exact same route. Define index. So color will equal request.query.get color. So whatever value comes in, color red color green, color yellow. These are hyperlinks, right? So form, so basically it's just form information, a hyperlink, a href, this is the route, question mark, color equals red, and then we're simply gonna put red so that you see that. Uh, color equals green, green, color equals yellow, yellow. We're gonna come down here. So page equals, so we're gonna say it's web app, so just call it web app at the top as a title body style. So a body is information for the entire page. So when you're dealing with HTML tags, it's the entire page. And using CSS, so style is going to equal background color, background hyphen color, colon, and then whatever value has come in. So again, red, green, yellow. We're getting that value here. We're assigning it to this variable name here, and then we're pulling it in here. Uh, then we have form. So that form that we created, this is going to get dumped in here, and then we're going to close the body. We're then going to return the page, run localhost, port 8080. So when we run this, and we do this. Okay, so when we first do this, I haven't done anything yet, so the background color is just the default background color. So we have web app, so it's kind of like the header, and then this is the form, red, green, yellow. Uh, if we go and we take a look at the page source, again, we can see a ref question mark color equals red red question mark color equals green color equals yellow right and so since we now can send the value so i click on red come on now i click on red there you go ah, right so the background color so the background color is the value that came in through the git so if you can see up here, slash question color equals red. And so now the background color is red. If we click on green, now the background color, color equals green, background color is green, yellow, again, color equals yellow, background color is yellow. And so that's how you can send values um, to your uh, your bottle web app using git uh, and again like i say with most of this uh, it is relatively simple and again you could do much more complicated things obviously going in the future uh let's see here uh then we have templates uh we're not going to go a lot into templates today because they're a pain in the ass again they've actually got their own template language when i talk about template language that is where we talk about this uh, so if you take a look at this and you're going to notice it looks different than other things that we've done, and that's because it is different than other things that we've done. The other thing to realize too is with template languages, uh, the template languages are different. Uh, so when I use Django, Django has a specific template language. That isn't this. It's not this. Bottle is using this particular template language. And so again, it's one of, that's one of the big things when you're learning technology is, um, you know, you can know, you can know what you want to do. You can understand the basic concept. I want to do an if statement. Figuring out the syntax of how to do the if statement uh, can be a pain in the butt. 
Uh, so anyways, uh, so from a bottle, you're going to import template for the template function. You're then going to create a views folder in your root directory. So generally, eh, generally your root directory is going to be your user directory. Right, so if we go here, I click on Finder, I click on Eli. So Eli is my user root directory. You can see I have a views folder here. And in that views folder, I have two template files, .tpl files. So basically this, the views folder for templates by default needs to be in your root directory. Generally, that should be your user root directory but depending on your computer, who the hell knows. Um, let's see here, the template files end with .tpl. Uh, basically, they allow you to create uh, dynamic web pages relatively easily. Again, you can create very complicated things. Um, you do return a template, whatever the value is. And then if you want to send variables to uh, the template, basically you do name, like name equals name. So variable name, equals whatever values that you're going to be sending. Uh, let me show you with these two things. Okay, so here is the bottle script. So from bottle, import run, route, and template. Uh, the first template that we're going to do is simply a hello underscore template. So this is going to be a static template. So the hello underscore template is simply this, just basic good old HTML. H1, hello world, P, this is a template, P, templates are HTML files that you can add variable values to, right? Uh, so basically, if I run this, and we go here, the route was hello, and so this is simply the template that I get. So this can be a lot easier, too. Again, one of the things you have to be thinking about whenever you're designing your web applications is where do you want to write out all the information, right? Do you want all of the information to be in that single like web app file, the, the, the bottle file that you're creating? Or would you like that information to be in things like the template files? That's one of the things you have to think about. Uh, but anyways, so this way you can create this whole little HTML document and it's its own file separate from that main file that we've been creating. And again, basically, hello world, this is a template, whatever, basically simple stuff. Uh, we can come down here uh, and we can send um, variable names uh, to a template. Uh, so we're going to have that, that dynamic route that we were talking about before. So at route, we're going to do slash hello hyphen var slash name, right? So whatever your name is. We're going to define hello underscore var. The name is going to come in. Then we're going to return a template, hello var template name equals name. So basically, this is the variable name that we're going to access in the template, and this is the information we're sending to that variable name. So it's important to understand here: you can send uh, you can send dictionaries, you can send lists, you can use send sets, you can send multiple uh, variables uh, to to your template. We're just using name here. So basically name is going to come in, name is going to go here, name is going to go here, and then name is going to get accessed on the template. If we take a look at this particular template, again, this is where we have that template language, hello, hello, squiggly squiggle, name, so basically that, that variable name, so the value will be here, and then close the h1. If name equals Bob, h1 name value is awesome. Bob is awesome else name is not as cool as Bob, which everybody understands. And then you have to do N. This is a pain in the ass. Uh, so all the template languages I've seen, maybe there's some out there that don't have it, you actually have to end the code blocks. If you don't put an end of some type here, everything goes to hell. So you open the code block with the if, and you gotta close it with the end. Again, we're not gonna go a lot, this is about all we're going into today because it's a disaster to get into, but just if things aren't working right for you, make sure you close the code block. Uh, so we go back and we do this. Okay, uh, hello var template. Um, so, okay, so slash hello underscore var underscore template slash Timmy. 
Oops, no, that was wrong. Uh, hello bar. Oh, uh, get too smart for your own good. Uh, okay, so hello underscore var slash Timmy. Uh, hello, oh, not underscore. Oh, golly, been a long day. Hello hyphen var slash Timmy. There we go. Thank God. Hello, Timmy. Timmy is not as cool as Bob. Make his eyes. If I go here and instead I put in Bob, hello Bob, Bob is awesome. And so that kind of processing is happening at the template. And the curious thing here too is we go to page source. What well, you'll notice is none of that template information is being sent to the end user. Again, that's one of the things you have to be thinking about is with security. Like when you're dealing with CSS, when you're dealing with JavaScript, a lot of things, all the, all the information, all the data gets sent to the web browser and the web browser actually processes it, which means if somebody does open source, they can see all of the information on the back end. Uh, so one of the nice things like with these template files and all of this is this web browser is only receiving the information that we're actually sending to it. Um, da, da, da. okay, everybody eh, basically understand template files. We're getting close to the end, don't worry. Yeah. So, those are template files, um, and then we have static files. <clears throat> and so, static files are complete pain in the ass for these web apps because, uh, again, you don't have a normal file and folder structure like you do with Apache or Nginx. Again, if you have Apache or you have Nginx and you want to embed a, um, an, H a, 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 a an image, a image, you know, a JPEG or a PNG, you just literally embed it. That's it. Uh, with static files uh, in Bottle or any of these other Python. <clears throat> web app frameworks, uh, you actually have to, to write a little bit of code so that's able to present uh, those files uh, to the user. Uh, any static files, such as images or CSS style sheets, so that's going to be an important thing. Again, you don't think about style sheets, but style sheets are files, and so if you don't ship them off to the end user, you think it's going to be ugly as hell, so you're going to need to use static files for that. Uh, for security, file server should be separate from the web server. Again, should be. This is one of the big things to be thinking about as far as security is concerned. One of the things that I hate is brand new college graduates that come out and start yipping about security all the time. One of the things you have to be thinking about with security is, again, you have to be thinking about the actual use case. If I am simply building some kind of administrative tool on my system to do something, my security considerations are a hell of a lot lower than if I have, you know, a REST API that, you know, I'm going to get 10,000 uh, visitors per hour, right? Those are two different security scenarios. So the static uh, files should be somewhere else, again, use some common sense. Uh, with this, you do have to be careful about file and folder permissions. Again, we start talking about that tech stack. Uh, if, if you have the folder or the files locked down using NTFS permissions in Windows or Linux permissions on a Linux box, right? If, if nobody has access to the file, they're not gonna get access to the file if it's locked down from the operating system level. Hopefully by default, this should be accessible, especially from your particular computer. But that is something to think about. Like that's that's one of the issues where you know you get into the problem of it works on my computer. So I build my app and I'm sitting like at the server and everything pops up fine. I'm like, the app works fine. And then my users, the app doesn't work. If you get get that issue. Well, then it means the code's working, Python's working, Bottle's working, right? Because when you're at your server and you pull up the app, everything works perfectly. That means the script is working perfectly. If your users are not getting the CSS, they're not getting the images, they're not getting those static files, generally what that means is that there's a permissions issue so that when the server tries to present those files to the end users, it's not allowed to at the operating system level, and that's a problem that you're running into. Uh, when you do this, again, it's going to be on your system. You create a static folder, again, in your root directory. Again, by default, standard, you can put it other places, but that's a different class. Uh, so you'll notice, again, 
Eli is my root directory. I have a static folder and in my static folder, I don't know if you can see that actually. Yeah, <laughs> I can, I have a PNG image uh, so that I can present that and I have a style sheet for the lab that we're going to be doing. And so that is in my static folder. Um, so we go to bottle static to show you how this works. Bottle static. Okay. Again, pretty simple here. Um, so from bottle import run route and static file. So again, there's a function for the static files. Route, again, we're simply doing the root directory. Uh, file equals, so the file that we're going to be embedding here is uh, image.png. That will be for an image. Uh, we're going to do the page. So link uh, relative. So this is where we do the style sheet. So link rel style sheet type text CSS. Ref. This is just word wrap. So ref equals slash static. So it's going to be the static folder slash style.css. So it's going to be the style.css file in the static folder. We open the body, uh, h1 static file. So it just has a picture of static file. Uh, ing uh, style equals height uh, 300 pixels, width equals auto. SRC equals slash static, so the static folder and whatever the file name is. So this is where if you're processing through and you're going to do an image gallery, you would do a loop to create all of these. And then P, this is an embedded uh, picture. We close the body. We return the entire page. Now on top of that though, where we've created this static, this static path, right? Uh, it's a dynamic path, again, because we've got the, uh, the image name there. So what we do here is we do at route, so it's a route, slash static. Uh, we do file name, colon path. So that filter I was talking about before, filter, you have an int, float, it's a string filter. We're going to do a filter for path. So the file name, we're going to create a function called send static. So this can be whatever you want it to be. The file name is going to be put into here. We're going to print um, the file name out. That's just going to print out on the screen so I know what's happening. And then we're going to return static file. So that static file function, the file name that came in, and then we basically have to say where the root of it is. So uh, period slash static slash. So that's the root. And so that's what should present this image to us. If we just take a look at the style sheet, just so you can see what the style sheet is. Body, the background color is bisque just to give you a color, uh, and H1, the color is red, so everything in the H1 tag will be red. Uh, so if everything works out right, a uh, static file should be red, it should be a bisque background color, and we have should have a 300 pixel by an auto uh, picture come up. Uh, so we do this, we run this, and we go, there we go. We get bisque in the background, we get static file, because that's a CSS. We get our nice little, you know, orcs and space marines and bunnies. I just love this picture personally. Uh, and then this is an embedded image. So the reason we can have the CSS and the reason we can have this image here is because we set up that static file. And basically all it is, is you create a static folder in your root directory. Then you do an at route static file name colon path. You create your function, you name your function. The important thing is that the file name comes in and then you do return. So this is the static file function that we imported up here. And we simply do whatever the file name is and then root. So basically root will be where that static folder is. So period slash static slash, and hopefully it should work out for you. And that is a lot of information. That's a lot of information. Uh, so that's a class. So before we get to the labs, um, Andy Fontaine just showed up. <laughs> well, Andy Fontaine is an hour and a half late. As Andy comes in and says, what did I miss? A lot. You missed a lot. 
Anyways, that's the basic idea of what we're dealing with bottle. Again, we're going to actually be using bottle a lot for the projects going forward because this allows us, again, to be able to create apps that look more like what you're going to think apps should look like. And the other nice thing about this is you can actually create apps, you can actually create tools that really will be valuable for you in the real world, even again, if they are a little simplistic. Are there any questions on what we've talked about today? And then we'll get to the labs. I'll tell you what the labs are. Jock. Yes. So we're applying a lot of, and again, this is just my interpretation of the, of the language. We're creating a lot of this on a web, web on a computer. Can these be applied to mobile as well? Or is that something totally different? Because when we, we, we say apps, I'm always thinking like apps on your phone. A lot of the functionality we're doing here, will it transfer to a mobile application or is that totally different? And I just need to learn this first and then move on to stuff like that. So this is a web application. So again, this local host, again, a whole different world if you understand what DNS is, right? So if you have an internet uh, accessible IP address, anything with a web browser will be able to access this at that IP address. Uh, so if you had DNS, so if I want to do like crappyapp.com and point it to this, and this is running, then you could pull this up on your smartphone. So you can use this on your smartphone. This, this is this is a web, web app, right? And that's where there's something called responsive uh, development. What responsive development is, is where you actually design the app based off of the screen size. That's its own world, different world. Uh, so yeah, so can you use this on a mobile device? Yes. Are you talking about an actual iOS app or Android apps, what we call a native app? No, this is not a native app. There's a different framework. I mean, I wouldn't use Python for creating native apps, but you can. We might teach it because it works, sort of. Uh, but that, that's a different framework. So this is simply for web browsers. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions before we get into the labs? Uh, you need to make CSS files that are responsive for mobile so it looks good on a phone screen. Oh, you need. Everybody likes to say what you need to do it. Yeah. What resources do I have? Tell me what resources I have. I will tell you what I need to do. Anyways, yes, but there is something called a responsive web design. Again, very big topic. Not getting it today. That's that's another issue. Uh, okay, so there are any other questions. Uh, we will take a look at the lab. So basically, we have a simple lab today. Uh, so the most simple lab, you can just do this one and then walk away and be like, I built a, built a simple app. Basically, it's a hello world. It's just you get it running, you make sure that it works, and you go away. Uh, then we have a, a, a note-taking app. Uh, so basically, with this note-taking app, what we're going to do is we're going to create an HTML form. That HTML form is for note taking. You're going to submit the information. It's going to be sent to a CSV file. So we're going to use a text file as that what's called our data store. Uh, and then what we're also going to do is we're then going to pull uh, the records out of that CSV file and print them onto the screen. Uh, and then we have a ping uh, lab. That's what I was kind of showing you in the beginning of the class. Uh, basically, what you're going to do is you're going to put in uh, what host you want to ping, cnn.com, 192.168.111.1, whatever. Uh, and then how often, so however many seconds you want to do the ping. Uh, and then that will be used uh, for network testing uh, purposes. Um, I do like network testing. You will notice in my classes, we're going to do a crap done ton of network testing apps. And the reason I like network testing apps Apps is because it's one of the easiest things that you can do that has actual utility and you get dynamic information from. I mean, that's one of the problems you get into, like when you're doing programming. So you're doing if else statements. How do you how do you get dynamic data coming in in a realistic fashion? It can be hard, right? Because if systems are doing what the hell they're supposed to do, right? 
Man. So anyways, the nice thing about uh, doing networking type apps is that, again, whether it's uh, whether it's latency, right? Network stuff just always does weird crap just on its own. And so that's very good stuff to test off of. So anyway, that's why we're always going to be doing a lot of network testing type apps. Okay, so lab.simple. Uh, so this is our simple lab. Uh, so let me just run it. Let me run it so you can see how simple this lab is. Here is our simple lab. Yeah, you create a web app. Web page. This is my very simple web page. Geek's first web app. And basically, the value of this is you just make sure you vaguely understand what the hell is going on. Uh, so anyways, uh, again, so you have to install the bottle module on your system. Python 3, space hyphen M, uh, space pip, space install, space bottle basically install install it. so from bottle you're going to import run and import route at route root find the index page again triple quotation marks just so we can put this on multiple lines h1 web page p this is a very simple web page we close the three quotation marks we're going to return the web page we're going to run it at the local host at port 8080 and there you go uh, so you can use this to play around. Again, if you're still trying to figure out the whole route thing, create multiple routes. Create an about route. Create a contact route. And you plug different information in there. So that's that one. Uh, the next one is our note-taking app, which is slightly more complicated. So let me run this. We're going to go to localhost at port 8080 again. Caused an error. Oh, access where it's not associated with a value. Oh, what's going on? Line 30. Data.html. For record. Try accept. The fuck? That should have worked. God damn it. Try, try with open. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. <clears throat> anyway, you're getting beta classes. <laughs> you're getting beta classes. <laughs> Uh, okay. There we go. Uh, I made a mistake there with the accept. Um, but just so you know, so we talked about try accept before, just so you understand what's going on here. So what we're going to try to do is you're going to try to open note-app.txt file as read, and we're going to do a lot of stuff. Now, the first time you run this script, this file isn't going to exist yet. Or there might be another issue. So anyways, so we do an accept down here where data underscore HTML equals nothing. So we're going to basically do an F string here where we concatenate the form with the HTML. So we're going to have the form at the top and all the notes down below. And so if for some reason it can't open up the note.txt file, that this value should be blank. I goofed up. Should be data underscore. Uh, Recording in progress. Oops. Hello? Oh, fuck. Where did I drop off? I do hate spe Spectrum. Spectrum is an interesting thing. You're back. You're back. Yes, yes. Three minutes ago. God damn it. Oh. Okay, so I had a problem, I had an issue, I fixed it. Uh, the issue was using this the try accept statement. So we'll just go over this real quick again. So what, what try, try accept does in the Python world is when you try to do an action, uh, let's say make it REST API call, send the command to the OS, open a file, 
right? One of the things you have to think about is what happens if it fails, right? And so anyways, so with this particular script, uh, it's a note-taking app. So at the top of it, uh, you're just gonna have a little HTML form to add a note. Uh, and then below that, uh, we're gonna have all the previous notes. But one of the things to think about is what happens the first time you run this script, right? Well, the first time you run this script, if you try to open this file, it's not going to exist because you've never run the script before. So anyways, so try basically to open this particular file and do stuff with it. And then accept if you can't open this file, then the data.html, this variable we're going to use in the future, just basically make it blank so that we can keep going along. So it's kind of like why you do a try accept statement. Uh, so anyways, let me run this thing. I can see how it works. Note taking app. Okay, so uh, we have no notes. So let's say a title for a note and a note. Uh, let's see, uh, class note just show try accept statements. And then I can hit submit. Okay, so put the note here and then it automatically comes here, class notes. Now let's say I want to add a new note. I say new note. This is a new note. And I hit submit. And so uh, this is also doing chronologically. So the newest one is first, old one, so on and so forth. So if I do another one, submit. Um, is there. That's actually important. All right. So anyways, so this is showing you. So this is a full flush. You have localhost 8080. This is an actual web app that is actually running. You could use this for a crappy ass journal script or whatever else. Uh, Jack, what's up? So you're not, you're creating new notes every time, but you're not rewriting because you have the R there on the original note. Like you have, so say for instance, you want to add to new note. You're not, you have to constantly just create new notes. You're not rewriting one of those note sections. Uh, let me explain the code. I'll explain the code and then you'll understand. We haven't got that part yet. Okay. Yep. Okay. okay. So, so this is basically this, right? Uh, but one of the things I do want you to notice here is this, right? So I said CSV file. Uh, when I say CSV file, it means comma separated value file. So basically we're, we're inputting records onto each line, right? So we're going to read through each line of this text file and each line is going basically going to be a value for an index right index zero will be the first line second line right so those are the entire record and then we talk about csv file what a csv file is is that then each value in the record is separated by commas one of the things you have to think about is most of the time your systems are going to crash not because of zimbabwean hackers but because users do something you're not expecting. And so if you actually use comma separated values, you use commas as a separator, and you're doing something like a note taking app where somebody might put commas in just on their own, what happens basically here, there's supposed to be two values. There's supposed to be a title value and a note value. Title, separator of some sort, value. So you actually do a comma, title, comma, uh, what note? What happens if people put multiple commas into that note? Instead of having two index values, index zero and index one, that's very easy to deal with, you might have 10 index values and it becomes a disaster. So anyways, a separator we actually use in here, although we call it a CSV, I just use the two bars because nobody puts two bars into anything, hopefully. But anyways, uh, let me just kind of show you how that works. Okay, so from bottle, import run, route, request, redirect, and post. Starts to get a little long. Uh, route, route for root, define index. So we're going to have the form. New note, break, form action, slash process, method equals post. Title, so it's a text box, and the name is going to be title, break, note. It's going to be a text box and the name is going to be note. You might want to make that a text area. Again, that's just HTML forms. Uh, then we're going to do an input type equals submit for the submit button. Uh, and then we're going to do slash form um, and that's going to close the form. So this is going to be the form itself.
Then we're going to come down here to our little try state. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to open the note-app.txt file in the mode of read so that we can get all of those, those records, all those note records from. It. So with open, right, as file, data equals file.read lines. So if you do read, it'll read everything in as a string, and that's a mess. If you do read lines, basically what that does is it turns every uh, line in that file into a value for the index. Index 0, index 1, index 2 for a list. So data is now going to be a list with all these in there. Uh, data underscore HTML is going to equal blank. So we're going to create this uh, so that we can basically create data.html is going to end up being this information right here. Okay, so for record in data, so for each uh, index in data, value equals record dot split. Uh, uh, bar bar. Uh, anyways, the thing over the backslash. Basically, that's just a separator, right? Um, anyways, uh, data HTML f string. So we're gonna do strong. So this is gonna be for the title. So strong means bold. So value zero will be the title, make that strong. Value one is going to be the rest of the note, right? So where the record comes in, so the record comes in as the line, title is at the index zero, note is at index one, title, uh, note. Then at the end of it, we're going to add whatever has been in data HTML before. So when we first run this, it'll be blank. And then basically, as we loop through, we're going to build up that data, dot, that data underscore HTML variable value with all of this HTML in there. Uh, HR is for the line. The line that goes across is HR. If, uh, for some reason, basically that file cannot be open, data underscore HTML is simply going to be blank. Page equals form, so the form that we created with all of those records underneath. So the form here, we're going to send this to process. And now this is where we have the post for process. So we use the post decorator for process route, define process. Title equals request.forms.get title. So the title name, it's a post, so we use forms. Note equals request forms.get note, right? So with open note hyphen app.txt a for append, this adds to the end as file, file.write f string. So the value for title, bar bar, the value for note slash next line. So it's gonna put the title with the, the with bar bar with the note, and then it'll go to the next line. And then once it has written to here, it's appended, we are then going to redirect back to the original uh, file original route. And so that is what's going to bring us back here. So we can put a new node in, we hit submit, that information is submitted to that process script, that process script processes it, sends it into this, uh, this text file, and then redirects back here. If we go and we take a look at the text file now, again, we go to Eli. Uh, again, this will, this will be written to your default, your root directory by default. Uh, we can simply open this with Visual Studio Code, and you can start to get the idea, right? So class note, bar bar, so that's a separator, just show try accept statements, slash n for next line. New note, bar bar, this is a new note. Next line, bar bar, comma comma null, next line. Right? And so this is kind of one of those things you need to be thinking about, is like with separators and all that is making sure, again, if you actually do comma separated values, it might turn into a damn disaster when you actually go to try to process the information. Kind of one of those things uh, to ponder. Uh, let's see here. Um, and then the final one is the lab ping. Lab ping. Where's my lab ping? There's my lab ping. Okay. So with this, we're going to use um, the OS uh, module 2. So we're actually going to be uh, 
using uh, our operating system to actually be able to ping. And that's one of the things to be thinking about. Again, when we start building um, these, uh, these Python projects, the big thing with Python is you can access all of these different resources. You can use Python, you can use Bottle, you can access APIs, you can access the operating system. So we're gonna basically be using the operating system in order to run the ping command. Uh, so from Bottle, import run and route, pretty simple. And then we're gonna import OS. And route, root directory, host, so this is going to be who we're going to ping. We're going to ping, ping CNN.com or we're going to ping Fox.com. You can ping Fox. I don't care. Uh, right? That goes in there. 192.168.1.1. Anything that's pingable, essentially. And then we're going to have uh, an inter interval. So how often should this ping occur? Every 10 seconds, every 600 seconds, every 3 seconds. And that's supposed to be an integer. So define index. Host value comes in. Interval comes in. Command equals F string ping space uh, hyphen C space one and then whoever you're pinging. So if you're using um, when uh, if you're using Linux or if you're using Mac, make sure you have to do a ping count. It does not automatically stop in Windows. It should ping four times and then stop in Linux and Mac. If you do the ping command, it'll keep going until you tell it to stop. So you have to tell it to stop here. Anyways, response equals OS dot P open. So OS module, the P open function, command and dot read. So we're going to send this command and then we're going to read the response, uh, the results back to response. We're then going to go here. We're then going to basically uh, take a look at the response that we're going to get. So if one packet's received in response. So for the, the Mac world, you'll get one packet's received if it actually works. In the Ubuntu, in Ubuntu world, you'll get one received. So basically, you're looking for some set of words that correlate to whatever the hell it is that you're looking for. Uh, so if we get one packet received, color equals green, else color equals red. Uh, page F string, so meta, HTTP, equiv, refresh. So this is an HTML um, meta tag to automatically refresh at a certain interval. And so content equals, and this is going to be what that interval value is. So three seconds, five seconds, 500 seconds. H1 ping app, H3 style, uh, background color, and the color, and then the host. So basically in H3, we're going to make the background color either green or red based off of whether or not the ping is coming back properly. And then we're going to say what the host value is. And then we're going to use pre-tags for what the response is, the response that we're actually getting back. Right, we're going to put that out here, and then we're going to return the page. What this is going to look like when we run it. So we come here, and again, I can do slash foxnews.com, because people think I'm biased towards CNN all the time. And then we'll ping it every three seconds. So localhost colon 88 foxnews.com slash three. And so we can see the ping app. Fox News is green because it's coming back. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three. So there we go. And we can see it's updating. You see, this is the uh, latency. And so we can see every three seconds the, light, the, the latency is changing uh, so that we know that we're actually getting some dynamic information here. So again, if you want to do some extra credit work, you can try to figure out how to uh, parse off of something like this um, and then, you know, change colors or do something. So anyways, this is just a way, again, to kind of give you something a little dynamic here to show you how this kind of uh, bottle web app framework might actually create something useful for you uh, if you're doing troubleshooting. And the nice part about this too is, again, even though this, this looks like a web app, this is simply running on your computer. So you could have a crappy, again, you could have some crappy, you know, 14 year old computer uh, that's sitting beside the server as you're doing troubleshooting, you could have a script like this running and it's just auto doing its thing. And when you do things properly and you get the network up and running, it gives you green. And when you pull the wrong plug, it gives you red. And again, it might be some kind of a thing that you can use just to get a better idea of what your environment looks like. Um, ooh, there you go, there you go two hours of class. So those are the labs and that is the class. Do we have any questions from anybody? Jock. I've got to get some more questions from other people than Jock.
Yeah, can't be the only one. What's up? Like, I'm gonna look at when you do the post it to the YouTube to go over like the first part again because I'm still having trouble with the IP address and ADA. I'm starting to try to understand that, so that would be one thing. I have a question about Pause Lab and using iOS. So I'll wait till everyone else asks that question and I'll come back and ask that. And it deals with shells. Okay, yeah, let's uh, give it one second then. Uh... Anybody else have a question? Uh, on Windows, ping C. Oh, yeah, on Windows. Here, here's, uh, fuck Windows. <laughs> Look, I got my MCSE. I used to be a Windows fanboy. I want to be crystal clear here. I was a Windows fanboy all the way up until Windows 8. And when Balmer told me to suck it, I went to Mac. Uh, but anyways, yeah. So when I'm doing these classes, just so you know, um, I'm primarily focused, again, I've got Mac. Primarily focused on Mac and Linux. Um, trying to make things work on Windows, most likely for the Windows users, the Windows portions of these classes uh, will get better uh, as we go. Uh, Windows, look, Windows is Windows. <laughs> Windows is just fucking Windows. <laughs> so anyways, yeah, so a lot of this stuff, um, yeah, just, eh, I hate to say, if you're on a Windows machine, some of the stuff may not work properly. Uh, again, I'm trying, again, it's one of those things, one of those things. I hear you. I understand it's a problem. <sighs> oh, we'll, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. So, uh, so yeah, I know. I know that kind of frustrates some Windows users, but it's just true. I mean, it, it's like if you're gonna pro, honestly, honestly, if you're gonna learn to program, like not even a Mac, not even a Mac. I gotta tell you, Ubuntu is just a champ. Like, like the issue you gotta worry about. Is it's the whole tech stack thing? Because again, when we talk about this, right? You have Python, you have Bottle, but then you have the operating system, and then you have drivers and hardware and all of that kind of stuff. The nice part about Macs is that most of this stuff really does just work. If you want OpenCV, so computer vision, it's gonna work. Olama's gonna work. All this stuff is basically gonna work pretty easily. Um, and the issue you get to is with Ubuntu is Ubuntu generally works very well. From from simply a coding standpoint, Ubuntu is actually probably a superior operating system even to Mac. The issue is you get the device drivers. Surprise! Free operating system. Device drivers are, aren't always perfect. So that gets to be about quirky. Uh, and then the issue, you get into Windows. Well, Windows is just Windows. I don't know what anybody wants me to say. It's just fucking Windows. Uh, you got security going on. You got, oh, it's just a mess. Just a mess. So anyway, um, so yeah, that's where, yeah, for all the Windows users, I will, I will try. <laughs> It'll get better. Maybe, kind of, I don't know. I'm giving you free education. Can you afford a Mac? Uh, how can I test which OS I am on in Python? You look at your computer. <laughs> Actually, you no, know, you don't look at your computer. You look at the glares people are giving you about the computer you use, right? If people look at your computer and they don't care, you're probably using Windows. If they look at your computer and they're interested, then you're using Ubuntu. If they're looking at your computer and they give you a sneer, then you're using Mac. Um, uh, uh, I mean, you should know. I, th I mean, there is the OS commit. There is um, in Python. So again, if you don't, if you really don't know, there's the OS version. Um, Python check OS version. There is actually for uh, get the OS name and version in Python. Uh, Platform.system. OS.name. Yeah, let's see what an OS.name is. Uh, oops. So go here, control N, uh, import OS, name equals OS dot name, print name, control S, name, put that on my desktop. Close that out. String object is not callable. Want to read?
string object is not callable. Name equal app. Oh, there. Okay. Um, yeah, but I, mean, I don't know. It gives you POSIX. Good question for ChatGPT. <laughs> like, can you do it? I'm sure you can. Um, you can probably send a command, like, because po basically, po when you see POSIX, basically it's it's a Unix, a a Unix, uh, it's not Unix, it's a Unix-like, it's generally a Unix-like operating system. Um, so yes, can you? Yes. Yeah, I don't know. Google it. Google it. <clears throat> um, NT is for Windows. Oh, there you go. So which Windows? Um... And except it should be a data underscore HTML instead of data in the lab file. Yes, you are correct. That was the mistake I made, and I will modify it. You're back now. Okay, cool. Okay, Jock, where are you at? Uh, what's your question, Jock? Uh, so we got... I actually have stuff to do today. So we have like another 10, 15 minutes, and then I got a book, and then I'll see you all in like two weeks or whatever. Uh, my question is real quick. It was so I ran, so again, I'm doing the labs at our lecture, and sometimes I have to do late. So I was doing our HTML lab, and specifically we were dealing with CSV files, and, I, and when you do it with a Mac, it puts it in the pages, and that's where it's stored until we call it and you said put it into the file where the that's going. So I tried to run it and the, when I was running it on Python, Matt said I was doing it. I basically got it to work, but it said the default, like the default interactive shell is now ZSH. What exactly is a shell that I'm trying to figure out that Mac uses? Or I've heard this term before, not from you, but other things like that. So I'm trying to understand, like, when it says a shell, like, um, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out, like, is that something a Mac thing, or is it like? So, so this 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 is the shell. Um, so any is shell is however you're interacting with the system. Uh, so even with Windows, you used to be able to swap out. So the graphical shell you used to be able to swap those out. Um, so like in the Linux world, uh, what well, there's Plasma, there's KDE, there's GNOME, there used to be Unity. And that's the, the graphical user interface. That's a different shell, right? So even with this ugly ass thing, even with the command line, there's actually different shells for this. So Mac, I guess, uses ZSH. I don't really pay enough attention to it to really care. Uh, so, so yeah, so this, this is, the, so yeah, so you can see ZSH up here. So ZSH is this, and basically within the shell, you're gonna get like tools like ls hyphen l. That's a that's a that's a tool within that's that's accessible within the shell. Um, so different shells give you different functionality. Um, I just use whatever the hell the default is. So that's that's all it is. Okay, that helps a lot. I kind of understand. Now we can install different shells in that. Or I'm guessing there's specific shells for specific operating systems. Uh, well, so so you get in the Linux world. Linux Linux is all about, and that's where we talk about distributions, right? So there's something called forks. So when you get to Linux, you have the Linux and the kernel and all that, and then you have the the major forks. Uh, you have Debian and Red Hat Linux are major like major the, the major, and that's where big things are different. How you install applications is different, like. Red Hat is a yum or something. Uh, Ubuntu or Debian is a uh, app to get. Anyways, there, there's big differences and those are the forks. And then beyond that, do you then get into the distros? So like in the Red Hat world, you have Red Hat, which is like the enterprise distribution. You have Cent OS, which IBM just killed. It used to be the, it used to be a great distribution, but it now sucks and you have Fedora. So what that is, is that uses the, ma the, the basically the major code base of the Red Hat world. They just adjust 
certain things like like specific tools will be slightly different but it's mainly the same again when you go into the debian world so ubuntu is a debian operating system uh debian distro uh you get you get ubuntu and kbuntu and all the, the the buntus out there those are different distros um you get a what, arch linux is that debian you got a whole bunch of different things, right? So anyways, with the distros, that's where people go in and they decide to really, really tweak things. So again, like when you start talking about shells, again, what there, there's Plasma, is a Plasma, KDE, Gnome. Uh, again, I think Unity died. Unity was Ubuntu's thing. I think they finally killed him with Gnome. But that's, you can go in and you can change different shells. And so like back in the day, the cool kids, if you go back 20 years ago, there would be different command line shells, and those command line shells allowed you to do different things, especially when doing administrative tasks and that kind of thing. Um, again, I don't know. You all can argue with the chat section. I just, I just use whatever the fuck the default is anymore. <clears throat> um, so that's where, like, the, the the only way I would say you would normally touch a shell nowadays is if you're looking at like low resource. Uh, utilization so like um ubuntu uses no three i think it is uh and that gives you a lot of the the, the you know gives you the, the graphical stuff but that requires cpu time that requires ram in order to do so if you have a computer that only has like 512 megs of ram and a really like a 12 year old um Celeron processor, it may not be able to deal with the normal Ubuntu shell, the normal GNOME shell. So that's where you might go with KDE, which is a lot smaller. So it's like a very idiotically specific use case. Uh, normally you don't screw with it, I would say. Okay, yep. thank you for the explanation, appreciate it. Yep. Linux uses Bash. Yeah, I guess so, Mac uses CSH. Yeah, so Linux, so you go to Linux and you go to the command line. Again, I don't, I mean, I know it. I don't even care. So there's something about Bash. Bash is called Born Again Shell. Yep. <laughs> Linux is, or Mac is ZSH. I guess there's differences. I guess there's differences. I can't tell you the last time I cared, though. <clears throat> yeah. da, da, da. Is this local work simple to deploy or are there more things to know? Uh, again, goes on a whole, what do you mean by deploy? If you're going to deploy this onto DigitalOcean, there's a lot more. Uh, again, when you do this, so when you're running this now, I mean, it should be accessible to your local area network. Again, from a security standpoint, you got to be careful about that too. Um, anyways, so if I run a bottle app, it should be accessible local area network so so i could i could again and that's where that's where you have to think about like what deploy means right so if you simply want like some kind of administrative tool just so you can monitor what the hell is going on again you grab a, a 12 year old mac you build your little script you have this running and then you can access it from any computer on the lan and again as long as you don't do, do anything stupid you should be fine uh if you're actually going to be deploying this though deploying it again to something like DigitalOcean. So you could use Bottle, again, for like your own API. So imagine, again, we talk about service-oriented architecture, SOA. And with SOA, there's something called microservices architecture, which is kind of, SOA is generally the idea is you're using other people's services. Uh, microservices is more the idea that you're actually creating services in-house. So let's say you wanted to create a REST API for other departments in your company. I don't know what, right? So let's say there's there's multiple departments in your company that that need some type of information. Uh, let, let's say utilization, uh, utilization, right? So um, how many people are in facilities? So let's say you have you know multiple buildings. And so you want to know, you want to have one system that tracks what is the temperature inside the buildings? What is the humidity inside the building? Uh, what is the current use? How many people are inside the building? Let's say you just want a whole bunch of information, right? Then you got to store that into a database. You have that for many different, uh, different, uh, different uh, 
buildings, right? And then let's say your your facilities, your facilities people want to know what the temp is and want to know what the electricity consumption is. Uh, and your HR people, uh, let's say they want to know how many employees are in the building. Um, and let's say your marketing people, they want to know how many like, people are actually in the building. So anyways, let's say you use Bottle. You basically, what you're going to do is you're going to scrape some type of database system that you have that's collecting all of this information. And then you want to create a very simple REST API. So the IT people for facilities can get the information and HR people can get information. And these other people. So again, low, again, low usage. You're not getting thousands of people an hour. Relatively low security. Oh my God! What if the hackers know what the temperature of your building is? Who the fuck cares? Anyways, right, that kind of thing. Then, like, you could use Bottle to to create a REST API to do that. If you're going to do that, though, that is where you have to do a couple of things. Right. So again, this gets to the whole thing of the things I still haven't taught you. So there's something called VENV, we will teach you at some point. It's called virtual environments. Basically what you do, so we talk about virtualization, basically trying to compartmentalize things. So what a virtual environment does is it basically silos your Python script. So all of your different modules, you can install into this one virtual environment. You can then run that Python script in that virtual environment, and then it gets the resources of that virtual environment. So, again, if you're going to be putting Python into anything considered production, the first thing that you do is you would set it up for a virtual environment. The next thing, again, depending on load and a whole bunch of other stuff, is there's actually a web server. So Python uh, has numerous web servers. Um, and there's a lot. There's like 10. Uh, Gunicorn. There's something called Gunicorn. Gunicorn, I don't know. Is that the most popular? It's the one I hear about most. Anyway, so what the web server does is it actually is kind of what presents, again, bottle and all that information to the end user, right? That that web server actually has to do that. And so the thing to think about there is, again, there's, there's something like 10 different viable web server options. You can go into the bottle configuration to change which web server you're going to use. Um, and so that's one thing to have consideration for. And then the next thing, again, if you're going to employ that, deploy this, is generally you would use Nginx. So Nginx is a web server. So you'll hear about Apache, Nginx. I don't know, is IIS still around? I don't know if it's still around. Anyways, normally Nginx or Apache, they actually provide the, the websites themselves. But one of the things that Nginx can do is, again, something called a reverse proxy server. So users come into Nginx. And then Nginx can then route traffic appropriately to a cluster of servers or other things. The big thing, the big thing with Nginx though, even if you've only got one box, even if you've only got one little crappy as uh, DigitalOcean server, is there's a lot of functionality in Nginx to make sure that the connections are stable when information gets cached and everything works properly. So generally you wanna put Nginx in front of your bottle app. And so, more or less, you got to do the rest of this mess to put something into production. Uh, there's a lot of documentation on it. Again, if you go to if you want to use DigitalOcean, DigitalOcean is pretty simple with it. They have this all written out. Um, yeah, that's kind of how you turn that into production. And again, you got to think about it. again security concern. What are your security concerns? What are um, the load? Again, with Bottle, Bottle's great for doing what we're doing. You know, if I was going to have real traffic going to it, I'm not sure I'd use Bottle. So, things to think about. Uh, you can even use PowerShell on Linux. Yay. Let's use PowerShell on Linux. That sounds fun. Will we cover environment variables? Yeah, as soon as I have the brain power. I have to turn everything into classes, and I have to turn everything into classes, classes somebody might actually show up for. So I'm trying to figure that one out. I mean, environment variables are pretty... Environment variables just to do are simple. The problem with environment variables is teaching it in a class 
and making sure it works for most of you people, that's where it gets to be a bit of a pain in the ass. So, uh, so yes, we will. I will most likely do a class on virtual environments and environment variables and PIP. We still really haven't even done a class on PIP at this point. So I'm trying to trying to wrap this into like an hour long class that we might be able to do something useful with. Um, so yes, will we do environment variables? Absolutely. When I don't. Thank you. This was awesome. Good deal. Cool. Well, I'll be right be running in a few minutes too. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna have our next class. I don't know. Not this Friday. I think it's next Friday. Is it? I think um, on a SQL light. Uh, so that's a relational database that is really, really easy, kind of like bottle. It's really easy to deploy and implement. Uh, so that class is coming up. Uh, and then again, my goal is so hopefully by the time we do the SQL light class, um, my outside of frame world will be a lot simpler. Yeah, hopefully. Is <laughs> Anyways, and then my goal is to really start rocking and rolling with these and start doing a lot more classes. Uh, also, for anybody that's like missed classes, uh, the goal is to also start repeating. I, th I think I think we're probably going to try to do like a three month cycle, maybe. Um, and so as we get about three months out, we'll do like the next cycle and we, we might try to do it at like a different time frame. So I've been doing it at two o'clock because it works for me. Uh, I am thinking about starting to do like maybe like 10 o'clock in the morning, like doing some 10 o'clock in the morning classes, my time, Eastern time, and then maybe some like six o'clock at night classes. And maybe with that, you know, start to be able to get more, more people on different schedules. Uh, so that's hopefully going to be coming up in the fall. And uh, yeah, so, okay, it is 4.10. And I do got to go if there's no questions. Any questions from anybody left? Five, four, three, two. Okay, folks, I will see you next Friday.